What can I say about it? I had it. I did it. Mm -hmm. Hi, we are in a different location today. This is actually what I usually am looking at. Usually I'm filming facing that way. So you can see the other side of my room. This is where we put all of Kurt's paintings. I love this painting, by the way, and Kurt hates it with a burning passion. So somebody back me up on this. Um, I really love it. So anyway, it is the end of the year. Why am I getting messages? Speaking of Kurt, he got his wisdom teeth. My husband, Kurt, um, he got his wisdom teeth taken out last night and um, it's been an ordeal. I've been hearing about wisdom teeth since I met this man. <laughs> he got him taken out, and so he's giving me like minute by minute updates of his pain level. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna talk about what I read in, what month is this, November. It is a rainy day. I don't know why. I feel like it doesn't rain that often, but whenever I film a book video, it's raining. So cozy vibes all around. A little bit of coffee, hold on. This video is sponsored by the lovely Book of the Month, um, who you should know about by now, and they are a book service where they have an entire team comb through tons of new releases to pick the best ones, and then you have the opportunity to choose one or multiple. You can add on different books every single month for a low controlled price, and so these are all going to be new emerging authors or some of my favorite authors, which we'll get into in a second. They're all gonna be hardcover. You can cancel anytime, it's super easy. And right now for December, if you use the code JOLLY, your sign up is only $5. So you will get your first book, $5. And um, let's uh, do a little time travel here. What books can we be uh, looking out for in December, Carrie? Can you, uh, can you hear me? Hi, it's me from a significantly colder day. I'm going to be telling you about the books that are in the December batch of Book of the Month. Olga Dies Dreaming. This is about two siblings who are both kind of living the high life in New York and then things just sort of fall apart um, based on their love lives, um, family stuff that comes up. Also, this is all kind of centered around the really devastating hurricane that hit Puerto Rico, all set in New York City. You know how I love a book set in New York. Next up is Somebody's Daughter, which is a memoir that comes with a big ol' content warning that this does involve um, sexual assault. It is about the author, um, Ashley Ford's experience growing up with an incarcerated father and always looking for love and wanting a father figure and having to deal with growing up without that and kind of how that shaped her entire world. So I'm gonna save this one for when I'm mentally ready, um, but it's an incredibly important topic, so I will definitely be reading this one. Somebody's Daughter. This one seems scary as hell. This is a flicker in the dark, <laughs> and it is a thriller about um, a girl who grew up in a small town in Louisiana, and when she was growing up, six girls went missing. Um, and it turns out her father was involved in the crimes or whatever it was, he was put away. Fast forward to present day where she is about to get married. She's living in Baton Rouge, having a great time. And all of a sudden girls start to disappear again. And she's kind of like, am I seeing things? Is this paranoia? There's no way that my father is involved, right? Kind of thing. Um, so apparently it's a very spooky thriller that um, I freaking love the cover so much. That is a flicker in the dark. This one just seems cute. Do we need a holiday romance? I do. I'm still considerably new to the genre, so I'm still always like really excited to see a themed one. And so this is called The Holiday Swap, and it's about um, twins. One is a kind of TV chef. Um, she's on this like survival show. Think of it as like the Great British Bake Off, I guess. Um, and then her sister works in the family bakery in this teeny tiny town. And when the celebrity sister gets an injury in which she can no longer taste or smell things, um, but she doesn't want to quit the competition, they decide to do a good old twin swap. The swap becomes a problem, as it always does. So that is the holiday swap. It just sounds cute. It's all about baking and love and the holidays. Great. When I saw that this was on the list, I shouted 
I'm so excited to read this. Shay Earnshaw is back. You know how much I love her. Um, Shay Earnshaw has another book called A History of Wild Places. Um, this sounds leaning more towards a thriller. We meet who we think is going to be our main character. This is all in the this is all in the dust jacket. I'm not spoiling anything. The first character that we meet is someone who is like an amazing detective he can like hunt down people no problem and so he is sent off to find this missing girl and it leads him to this place called the pastoral which is a creepy little idyllic compound and when he uh he gets there uh he goes missing so he's not our main character anymore so we end up fast forwarding a little bit and we're following this family that actually lives in the pastoral and we're kind of unlocking the secrets of their family but also pastoral as a whole yeah it's just all about this society that seems really idyllic but underneath of course of course it is not. Um, I love Shay. I can't wait. I can't wait to read this. So those are the five books for book of the month, but they couldn't stop with just five this month. So there is one that if you are a member, you can add this on um, to your book. Oh, here's your lovely box that it comes with. Um, it is Hem, the Anthropocene Reviewed. I had to look up how to pronounce that. These are essays by John Green, who I'm sure that you know, and it's kind of just about our current world. Um, so the essays range from technology to the natural world. Literally skimming, skimming through, I see The Black Death, Mario Kart, Magic, Chevrolet, Loneliness, Professional Baseball, Kuwait, Higgly Wiggly, yeah, so basically I think there's a little something for everyone in this. <laughs> those are the books. If any of those piques your interest, check my link down below. Um, back to the past. Bye. Let's talk about, let me get my list up. Let's dive right into it. I finally finished The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. This was on my autumn TBR. I kind of wanted to read it for um, Halloween, but I ended up finishing it like the first week. Is that money? Oh, um, I ended up finishing it the first week of November and it is just a kind of psychological horror novel. Is it considered gothic? It's about this psychologist who wants to prove whether or not there are spirits, basically. It's a classic haunted house story. He sends out a bunch of messages to people who have reported to have had supernatural experiences, and he basically says, hey, would you guys want to come spend a couple nights at this reportedly haunted house and just see what's up, see what happens. Two people get back to him and they show up at Hill House. It's kind of like the Winchester house where it would have, actually does it even? It's in my head, it has like stairways that lead to nothing and like doors that open to blank walls. But in reality, it's a normal house, but everything is just like a little bit off. The floor is just slightly tilted. Like you feel, it's almost like you're on a ship. You feel really disoriented. And so rather than there being like ghosts, it's really the house itself that's haunted. Yeah, I just thought it was really creepy. I just really loved the ambiance of it, just literally just the language of it, the typeface of it, um, and then obviously the story was really creepy. I can't explain this well, but if you are interested in kind of dipping your toe into horror or anything like that, this is a classic for a reason, um, and I really, I really enjoyed it. So, Haunting of Hill House, glad that I finally read it. No, I have not watched the Netflix series or show um but yeah just a classic great haunted house next up oh i have the physical one for this one too hey i read people we meet on vacation this is a classic friends to lovers story um and it's told in full flashbacks wow i have i feel like i read this years ago i don't even remember basically there are these two people Poppy and Alex and they became friends in college and they just started traveling together. They always took a yearly vacation together and like they 
always looked forward to it. It was such a great thing and they were just friends. And so we pop back and forth between present day where they are not friends anymore. Um, and then we pop back to all of their different vacations. They've known each other for like 12 years. And it's been two years that they haven't been friends and we, ha we don't really figure out what happens until a little bit later. Um, but we just know that they are not down to hang out with each other anymore. And Poppy really wants to fix this. Poppy feels very unhappy and stuck and just the last time she felt happy was when she was on vacation with Alex. And so um, she makes up this kind of weird scheme um, to convince him to go on vacation with her and they do. Um, and it just unfolds like they have to kind of unpack their relationship and why they aren't friends and why like nothing ever happened in this relationship and all this stuff. I liked it. I, I did really like it. Um, my main complaints were there was just one too many flashbacks for me. Um, I think that maybe some people who like romance enjoy the like cutesy date or just like blossoming relationship moments, but this was just one too many for me. Second, they are in Palm Springs. This takes place in Palm Springs. Um, I feel like Palm Springs is another home of mine. I spent a lot of time there growing up. My dad used to work there. Um, and they are staying in a place in which their air conditioning doesn't work. And I was just stressed the whole time, honestly. Like, I, they talked about how it was so hot. And I was just so panicked for them because the heat in Palm Springs, this is such a tangent, but like the heat in Palm Springs is just something else. Like it is, the last time I went there actually, my husband really wanted to visit the desert because there isn't really a desert in Korea and he's never been to one. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll drive you to Palm Springs. We get there. There was a heat wave to the point where even locals from Palm Springs were like, we're not going outside. It was like 120, it was hell. And so just like reading this and hearing about them sweating, I was like, are you guys drinking water? Like how, what is going on? So my absolute only complaints, this was a lovely quick read, especially if you're just like laying around the house, maybe it's the holidays, you just wanna kind of escape from your relatives pop this on for like three hours and you're good. Um, but yeah, my only complaints, one too many flashbacks and holy crap, I felt dehydrated reading this book. Um, Cause Palm Springs is hot and scary and I hope that they were drinking enough water. So the people we meet on vacation, overall great read. Thank you to Susan for gifting this to me. <laughs> Next up, oh my God, yeah, I was on a roll. I'm surprised that I got this from Candle doing okay? Okay. Um, I'm surprised that I got this so quickly from the library knowing that it is now going to be a film. But I did read The Hating Game and this was recommended so much by all of you guys after I read The Love Hypothesis. What can I say about it? I had it, I did it, mm -hmm. this is one of those things where it's kind of for me like a K-drama where I have to sneeze. <coughs> for me it's kind of like when you're watching a k-drama and you just have to kind of suspend disbelief at some point where these humans could not have functioned like 100% could not have functioned in real life there was no way that these are real people but and there's no way that yeah there's just mm, so much of this is just so unbelievable if you can just think of it as like I'm gonna read a ridiculous romance um yeah, it was funny. So The Hating Game is about two publishing companies that were kind of dying and so they combined so that they could survive. But neither CEO was gonna step down. So there are two CEOs, which means that there are two executive assistants, basically like, I don't wanna call them secretaries, but like super secretaries. Think of The Devil Wears Prada. What's her name? The redhead with the cold is. There are two of them, our main boy, our main girl, I do not remember their names, and they hate each other. The girl is really kind of peppy and wants everybody to love her and can't say no and is like people pleaser, bubbly, kind of a mess kind of thing. The boy is cold and doesn't make friends and is super work oriented and is really tidy and wears certain color shirts depending on the day. Like he has a pattern. So they hate each other. <laughs> and they kind of like 
exist through these games, which, like, on one hand, it feels really ridiculous, but on the other hand, like, I have worked in a corporate environment, and sometimes you're so bored that, like, yeah, you do need to come up with these things, but they have, like, the silent game, or, like, the question game, where they just, like, only ask each other really weird que- I don't know. They just play these really childish games to get under each other's skin. All of a sudden, this new job opportunity shows up, where basically there is going to be one head head assistant like tippy top assistant and a lower one i guess if i'm remembering this correctly anyway they're both going for the same job whoever gets it is going to be the other person's boss and they kind of make a bet that whoever gets it whoever loses it has to quit um and they agree to this and let the games begin oh that's how it starts Oh, that's how it starts. I totally forgot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a scene where there is a misunderstanding. There's also the misunderstanding trope, uh, briefly. And um, that's how their kind of, like, romantic line of the story starts. Right. Okay. So, yeah, it does feel very K-drama-ish. Hi. So, I'm editing my video, and I realized I completely forgot 90% of the plot of the hating game. Um, I forgot how smutty it is. There's there's a lot of like ridiculous yearning and sexual tension that's like to a level of absurdity that I like I've already said it but like you have to shut your brain off. Like you have to just be like this is a work of fiction. Yeah, I literally just remembered that. Um so I'm going to go back to editing but just a fair warning Wow, I forgot about all of those scenes. There it is. That Go back, back to me. Back to my blissful ignorance. <laughs> Do not though, however, thank God, I forget who posted on Instagram, but like, thank God they warned me. Do not watch the trailer unless you want to know the entire book. Um, they literally tell you the entire plot of the book in the movie trailer. I don't know. And also like the guy that they casted I always feel this way, but like the guy that they cast, it just doesn't fit what I'm, what I was thinking of. So anyway, you've been warned. I have to sneeze again. So next book. Next up is absolutely, do I want to make that call? Yeah. Okay. It is absolutely my favorite book of the month. It is If I Had Your Face. My mom has been telling me to read it for ages and I finally did. Um, this is a kind of contemporary drama I suppose um, taking place in my neighborhood like straight up on my street in Seoul it's weird um, very strange to read about it is about all of these different girls we switch points of view but all of these different girls who live in an office tell which um, in Korea is I live in an office tell. So all of these girls end up kind of becoming friends or having some sort of connection. One girl who is currently, she's working at a nail salon. She's working kind of everywhere, trying to make ends meet so that she can save up enough money to get plastic surgery so that she can become a room salon girl. And I don't know how to best translate it in English. Um, the book called them Room Salon Girls, but in Korea, there are just a lot of these like night entertainment places where you can go rent a room, buy a ton of alcohol, and just be surrounded by these beautiful women who are going to serve you alcohol and flirt with you and whatever. It's, it's huge here. You can either be one that's kind of shuttled around, so you get like picked up at night in a bus and they will take you to a place where you will work. Um, sometimes you will actually just work at one establishment and your customers will just come in to see you. So she wants to do that, um, but you need to be really beautiful, so she needs to save up money to get her plastic surgery. Um, her other friend and roommate is a girl who is a hairstylist, usually for these room salon girls or like celebrities and stuff. A lot of people go to salons here just to get their hair and makeup done for the day straight up. Um, so she does that. Another girl is a room salon girl and she's kind of one of the best. She works at the salon that is known for having like the top 1% beautiful women. Who else? There's another girl who is an artist and she studied abroad in New York um, and then she came back to Seoul to work on her art. There is another woman who is just in a really not great 
marriage and she's having a lot of time struggling mentally stuff like that so anyway they all kind of combine the main thing i wanted to get that was so long um the main thing i want to tell you about it is that it is so accurate to current korean culture like every little detail is so correct if you are interested in contemporary korean culture unreal i feel like people don't talk about like that kind of culture that much it's not really like a story that has a beginning middle and end it's just more of a snapshot of their lives just absolutely incredible um if you are interested in korean culture a wonderful book if i had your face um the next two i'm not going to talk about because i did a reading vlog for them but basically i didn't like either of them and if you want my thoughts <clears throat> you can watch that video. Um, I read White Fox, which is a kind of like thriller, mystery, family drama, I don't really know. And then I read Circe, which a lot of you guys recommended, um, and it is based off of a Greek myth. Next up, I read Once Upon a Broken Heart. I was warned against reading it because this is going to be a duology, I believe, or at least a series. Um, and it's got a little cliffhanger ending, which um, I'm I'm hoping that Stephanie is working on this second book. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it is, how do I explain what this book is about? This is in the same universe as Caraval. So if you have read the trilogy, I believe it's Caraval, Legendary, and Finale. I would definitely recommend reading those first before you read Once Upon a Broken Heart because it absolutely spoils everything that happens in Caraval. It also is about a character who is in Caraval. So in this one, um, it happens actually pretty directly after the Caraval books end. Um, and we are focused on Jax, who is the prince of hearts i guess basically in caraval we are introduced to this deck of destiny which is sort of like these tarot cards but they actually hold immortal people so there is like you know in tarot it would be like the queen of cups could come to life kind of thing um and so Jax is one of the tarot cards prince of hearts he can kill you if he kisses you and that's his thing like that's his main thing so we follow this one girl who has her heart broken and she thinks the only way that she can fix the situation that she is in is if she can go to Jax's kind of temple and ask him for a trade ask him for help and she ends up going on this whirlwind adventure Jax has some kind of plan that we do not know that she does not know um, but she has become a pawn in it um, and it just has that very, just her word choices, it's so whimsical, the magical world that she creates, it just really reminds me of like, not to bring up, not to compare her in any way to this author, but if you can remember in your childhood what it felt like to read about like, Bernie Bot's Every Flavored Beans and like Hogsmeade or like in Honey Dukes, like all the different flavors of whatever, like that kind of whimsical, just like cute little details, these magical little items that don't necessarily build anything into the plot, but it just makes the world so rich. That's how I really felt like they're just the food that they eat, the color of people's hair, um, the names of certain shops. It just like warms my inner child's heart, I think is what it is. I had a good time with it. I thought it was very short. I was so upset by how quickly it ended. But I mean, that's, that's my main complaint is just that I wished that it was longer. Even though I know it's gonna be a series, I just wish that this one had a little bit more in it because I am impatient and I don't want to wait. So Once Upon a Broken Heart, if you liked Caraval, you will love Once Upon a Broken Heart. That's all I can say. <laughs> I took a break to let my camera cool off. Let's see if that did anything. Um, so what did I read next? I read Lake's Edge, um, which I talked about and I'm upset because I really, this is totally nothing to do with the book. Um, but 
I like to read my books kind of in one go. Um, I don't like to read multiple books at one time. I started reading this book, really liked it, and then I put it down so that I could read White Fox and Circe, which I did not like, and they kind of threw me into a reading slump where when I went back to read Lake's Edge, I couldn't really, it took me a long time to finish it. I actually like forgot about it, um, which is something I don't do <laughs> with books. So not the book's fault, just purely like, life got in the way and it kind of ruined my reading experience I think which is a bummer but Lake's Edge is about these two siblings I forget the son's the the brother's name but um Violetta is the main girl and um they just kind of wandered out of the woods one day when I think Violetta was like five and the brother was a baby and luckily a woman took them in, raised them as her own, and now they are 17 and I think 15 maybe. Things are getting weird because in this world there is like the lady who is kind of like their goddess and then there is like the lord of the darkness. Obviously the the goddess is the good one that everybody loves, right? And the brother starts to show these weird symptoms where he'll have nightmares and like shadows will start pouring out of him and he will kind of become darkness which is not good so the woman that took them in who was basically like their mother she just does not seem to be down at all she's like you know what i raised you guys but all this darkness stuff no way get out when the local lord like they have um kind of this ruling family when he comes to get their tithe he notices the brother and is kind of like I like that, I want that, come with me. Um, and so the the darkness stuff, not the brother himself, but like his powers. Violetta is like, no way are you taking my brother without me, I'm coming with you. And so begrudgingly, this like young lord guy takes them both back to his manor. And we start to learn about this darkness, this corruption that is kind of poisoning the land, um, and they need to fix it but it's a lot more complicated than that. Here's the thing, I liked it, I really did. I enjoyed the beginning of it and then I don't know if it was that I, you know, that weird reading experience that I had or if it just got a little bit boring. I think once we started understanding the curse, it was a lot of just like nothing happening, not a whole lot of action and just a lot of like emo stuff going on. I'm excited for the second one. I want to see how this continues, but it just felt like the stakes were high, but as far as like what you actually had to do, it felt like nothing happened because the way that they cast magic and stuff like that it's not very exciting the way that the kind of last quarter of the book or maybe the last third of the book unfolded i wasn't super on board um but will i read the second one yes lake's edge there you go next up i read how do you live which i did a whole reading vlog of um this is the book that tayaho miyazaki is coming out of retirement again to make one last Studio Ghibli film um, and it is going to be based off of this book. Um, it is a Japanese children's book from 1937 and I read it and I told you what I think so if you want to know more about that it will be linked above and below. Um, and then my final book, A. I also have a physical, this is also from Susan, thank you. I read Malibu Rising. This is by the same author as Da what is it called? Daisy Jones and the Six and then the Seven Husbands of... <clears throat> is it Evelyn Hugo? Yes, okay, the Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I feel so bad because there's another book that's like the Seven Deaths of something and I read those both at the same time and so I... anyway, I can't remember titles. Malibu Rising. When I saw the cover, I felt like this was gonna be a romance or like I don't know what exactly the cover really threw me off but I actually really enjoyed this book it is a oh we described this a family drama 
that also has the sprinklings of a thriller. It's about a family called the Rivas, and we bounce back and forth between two timelines. So we have present day where the eldest child, Nina, is going through a really rough time. Her husband just left her, but she also has to throw the party of the year. They've kind of every year thrown this like massive world famous party Hollywood elite, all this stuff. Everybody comes, it's wild. She can't cancel it. So um, it basically takes us on that 24 hours of her getting ready for this party and throwing it and everything that happens at the party. Um, we also are introduced to her siblings who all have their own issues that they're dealing with um but the reason for the cover is that they all live in malibu and they're all like surfers one of them is a pro surfer one is a surfing photographer um the youngest sister wants to be a pro surfer but nobody really pays attention to her nina uses surfing just to clear her mind she is a swimsuit model kind of thing um so it's all really really tied to malibu so we have that timeline and then we also have the timeline timeline of her parents and how they met and their very tumultuous relationship. Full disclaimer, there is a lot of alcoholism, there is accidental death, um, it, it's, it's a dark book. This is definitely an adult contemporary novel, um, but I thought it was really great and the element that I thought made it great was the very first chapter. Is it even a chapter? It's just like the intro. So luckily the author actually does live in LA and you could really feel this. The The introduction talks about um, California wildfires and what it feels like and just like how easily they can start and how it happens every year and how like the next year after that the wildflowers are always crazy. Like this idea of everything needs to be burned down in order for it to be rebuilt. And stuff like that. Just like the opening, I felt so connected to the author because she just explained my life experience back to me um, with California wildfires so perfectly, so I like trusted her immediately to tell this story. She also mentions that this day, the day of the party that we are reading about, Malibu catches fire again and it starts at the party and so the whole time you're reading this book in the back of your mind you're like counting down because they do talk about like they break it up by hour um so the closer it gets to the party the more I'm thinking like oh my god the fire is gonna start oh my god the fire is gonna start oh my god the fire is gonna start so it had this like hidden element of a thriller where I'm just like waiting for disaster um and so yeah, I just thought, I, I really enjoyed it. I went into it knowing nothing, being very confused by the cover. So yeah, I would definitely, definitely recommend Malibu Rising. I'm the worst and I'm back. Um, I just went for a walk in the rain, which is why I look the way that I look right now. Um, and I forgot to mention that I read a manga for the first time in like a hundred years. Um, and it was Censor by Junji Ito, which I like knew this in the back of my head, but I think I forgot it, that he is known for like horror manga. Um, so this was the story, it was very short, but it was like this phenomenon that was caused by possibly this kind of religious figure um, where there is like hair floating around and if you touch the hair, it can like connect you to the universe and you can like understand everything and blah, blah, blah. Um, it had a lot of different layers to it. I don't even want to go into the plot because what the heck. The art is horror for sure, but it was stunning. The story didn't wow me, but the art was like incredible. And I just want to read the uh, little bit of the acknowledgements at the end of this book. So he's basically saying like, these are all characters by the way, like Kyoko refused to be the narrator and was always going off and hiding somewhere. Um, Wataru wouldn't write any reports despite being a reporter. If only the characters would have actually listened to me, this could have turned out so much differently. But I'll end the excuses here. To be honest, the original structure was vague, and a homebody like me, who never does any advanced prep, could never have written tr a travel log. So this is really the result of the bus driving away before everybody is on board. <laughs> and I just thought that, that was so funny that he was like, yeah, you know, I just took the story where it went and it did not bring me along so um yeah anyway I also read that so I will 
put that on the list. Censor, Junji Ito. And then I technically, technically, it's November 30th, so I still have 12 hours to read this book. I haven't finished it yet, but last night I started The Keeper of the Night, um, which I talked about last month because it was a book of the month book for November. Um, but this is written by an author who is Irish, Chinese, and Japanese. And so this book is actually about a woman, a she, mm, what is she? She's a hundred years old. This this girl who is kind of a grim reaper basically. She's not human. She is like a child of death sort of. She's a soul collector but she is half British half Japanese and so the story is her growing up in England not feeling accepted, feeling um, the, like the fact that she was biracial um, nobody would accept her. She just looks completely different. Her powers are completely different. Um, so she decides to go to Japan and see if she can be accepted there. And so um, the story, I have not read much of it. I've only read 50 pages. Um, but the story is basically um, her trying to find where she fits and prove herself and, you know, find herself. Um, and so far I, I enjoy it. I think that the powers are really interesting. All the different reapers, like the rules of this society are really cool. I'm interested to see um, what it's going to be like in Japan, how that's going to change. Right now it's London in the 1800s. Um, so yeah, I am very excited to keep, to keep reading this one. So that's my last read of November is The Keeper of the Night. And so ends. Oh shoot. And then I forgot to talk about Cemetery Boys apparently, but I will link it down below. I actually did talk about it in another video, so I'll put it down below. That is all. My voice is absolutely gone. My camera is dying. I am stressed out about this candle resting on my precarious stack of books. Do not do this, guys. Do not do this. Um, so I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna edit this. Um, once again, thank you to Book of the Month. Check out the books for December. Don't forget that you can add on books. I am very excited for Shay Earnshaw's book. You have no idea. Um, and yeah, I will catch you guys next time. It looks like it's still raining, isn't it? Yeah, it was supposed to stop. I want to go for a walk. I will see you guys next time. Thank you to Book of the Month for sponsoring this. Um, I love you all. Please let me know what you were reading and look out next week for Sugar Books. Okay, bye.